Hey everybody, it's Mike here from the Parallel Systems Broadcast. Thank you for tuning in for our midweek show. On today's show, I've got all kinds of interesting information to try and help you make sense of the madness that we see all around us. We've got politicians coming and going. You don't know who they are. We are going to be looking at gold and silver, checking out what's going on. I've got some interesting articles here. This one is all about Ukrainian gold. And I went down a little rabbit hole and I found out that Ukraine has some very, very shady dealings when it comes to gold. So we're going to be looking at that. We'll also check out the markets and some companies that I've been looking at at the end of the show. And along the way, we're going to be looking at some QR code madness as the WEF installs some of its bought and paid for politicians in countries all around the world. So we've got all of these uprisings that seemingly just come out of nowhere, but then they always seem to end with another WEF puppet getting put into power. But before we get to that, let's start with this article here. This caught my eye. This is from Chris Powell at the Gold Antitrust Alliance. And Chris Powell said, has the US just stripped Ukraine of its gold reserves? That's quite shocking, isn't it? Has the US drained the Ukraine of its gold? Well, in this article, it says here that eight years ago, as Russia seized Crimea from Ukraine, Ukraine's gold appeared to have been hastily shipped to the United States. And it says that today the Ukrainian central bank acknowledged that 12 billion of its gold reserves recently was sold under pressure of the war with Russia that began this year. So that's very interesting, isn't it? Because the Western countries have been sending billions and billions of euros and trillions and trillions of pounds and equipment. God knows what the price is now. It's in the hundreds of billions for sure. And that's been coming from the US, the UK and Europe. And yet, it's also had to sell its gold. Now, I was wondering, where did Ukraine's gold go? So I started to dig into this. I'm not going to come up with too many answers, but probably more questions than answers. So let's just go to this article first. It says, Ukraine has sold 12.4 billion in gold reserves since the war's start. So we're talking since, when was it? February? February, March time? So that's an awful lot of gold to sell in just a few months. And it says here that Ukraine Central Bank has sold 12.4 billion in gold reserves since the beginning of Russia's invasion in February. We are selling this gold so that our importers are able to buy necessary goods for the country. The claimed amount far exceeds Ukraine's gold reserves just prior to the war. Okay, so that's extremely strange, isn't it? So apparently they have sold far more gold than they actually have. Doesn't make any sense, but that's apparently what's happened. It says, for the first quarter of 2022, Ukraine's gold reserves totaled 27.6 tons, valued at 1.69 billion, according to the World Gold Council. The 12.4 billion in gold reserves the nation claims to have sold since the start of the war is equivalent to 491 tons, which is 18 times larger than the first quarter gold reserves. So I've got this data here. This is the Ukrainian gold reserves going back to the year 2000. And you can see that it never exceeded 40 tons. In fact, the average for that period was around 25 tons. Now you can see that just coming out of the invasion of Crimea, that there was this massive drop in Ukrainian gold holdings. And then it kind of held steady after that. But then apparently, just recently, we've seen this massive drop. So that would mean that Ukraine has zero gold holdings and somehow managed to accumulate 18 times the stated gold holdings in the past few years. Doesn't make any sense at all. And I can't make head and the tail of it. Now, one thing that I'd like to point out is that gold is one of those things that is very, very easy to track. Unless you're mining it domestically, then pretty much all of the gold is accounted for. Like I said, in China, where they mine their own gold, yeah, you might not know how much has been taken out of the ground. But when we're talking about Ukraine, they don't really have any legacy of gold mining. And I'll go to this article here. Now, Ukraine has never, ever got a gold mine off the ground. In fact, when you look at the history of gold mining in the Ukraine, it seems awfully shady, like there was many attempts, but for some reason, nothing was ever pulled out of the ground. And within just a few years, the companies folded. So maybe it was some kind of money laundering scam. Maybe it was some kind of oligarch scam. I'm not sure, but let's go to this article here. It says that today, the state balance of mineral reserves of Ukraine takes into account gold reserves at six deposits. 
and I'm not even going to try to pronounce those locations, but it does mention the Luhansk region and also the Donbass region, which we know are the regions that are actually being occupied right now. But it also says that there's dozens of other gold deposits and or occurrences of varying degrees of exploration. Now we know that gold mining is extremely difficult and just because there's gold in the ground doesn't mean that it's easy to get it out or even economically viable. What you need is somebody to go in there and survey it, someone to do the preliminary work so you can find out how much is in the ground and how much it would cost to get it out the ground. So let's take everything we say with a pinch of salt, but one thing that I would say is that Ukraine has some enormous reserves of natural resources, so it makes sense that there would be a lot of gold in Ukraine. And it says here that despite the fact that information about the amount of reserves is a state secret, experts estimate the gold potential of Ukraine at 3,000 tons. Now that's an awful lot, that's an awful lot because according to the US, there is around 50,000 tons of gold remaining in the world. If that's true, then that means Ukraine has 6% of the world's reserves of gold. So I'm just going to take you through a little bit of a timeline of Ukraine's many failed attempts to get a gold mine off the ground. So it says that first of all, the Soviets did a survey in the 1980s and they established that there was lots of gold in Ukraine and the main gold bearing regions were the Ukrainian Shield, the Donbass and the Transcarpathia. So it says here that in August 1995, the state joint stock company Erx Zoloto appeared and they transferred for study and development of five deposits. And it says over 14 months of its existence, the company together with Canadian specialists, they got the Canadians in, this is legit. And they only managed to confirm the main parameters of promising deposits and the content of gold in ours and create a preliminary database of the deposits. So basically they did some preliminary work, nothing came from it. Now it says in 1996, the state program Gold of Ukraine was adopted, according to which the state, until 2005, should receive about 600 kilograms of gold annually. However, these plans were never implemented. In March 1999, a new company, Ukrainian Polymetals, was created, into which all the largest gold deposits were automatically transferred. Wow, that's amazing. So they got all the largest deposits in Ukraine very quickly. What happened? The enterprise existed until 2011 and unfortunately with zero funding, none of the deposits was included in geological exploration. And it says in fairness, it should be noted that the state did not abandon its attempts to develop its gold mining industry and already in 2012 on the basis of state regional geological enterprise, Ukrainian geological company was created. It was subordinate to the National Bank of Ukraine which in 2014 planned to obtain ingots from the precious metals of its own production and subsequently established gold production at the level of several tons per year. However, the plans failed again. The fact is that the vast majority of Ukrainian deposits due to their mining and geological conditions of occurrence can only be developed underground. Now, underground mining is more difficult than pit mining and let's, let's just leave it there. No one has ever got gold mining in the Ukraine off the ground and yet they had apparently over 400 tons. Now where did it come from? Nobody knows. It wasn't there five years ago, it wasn't there two years ago, it wasn't there one year ago but this year all of a sudden 400 tons of gold, 450 tons of gold appeared and then they sold it. Okay so we've talked about these magic gold reserves that appeared and then all got sold. We don't know where they've gone or who's got them. Let's go back to 2014 because if you look here, in 2014 there was probably a more legitimate number of 40 tons of gold, but that all got taken out of the country as well. So let's go back in time a little bit. 2014. As per the report of a source from the Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian gold reserves were confirmed to be moved on an aircraft from the Bristol airport at Kiev to the United States. The report says that about 40 tons of gold was flown from Ukraine to the US. However, according to the World Gold Council, Ukraine has in store 36 tons of gold reserves. <laughs> so, again, there was something fishy going on with the Ukrainian gold. There was meant to have 36 tons. 40 tons got taken to the US. Again, where did the extra four tons come from? Nobody knows. Gold reserves in 40 sealed boxes were loaded onto an aircraft which remains unidentified and was reported to be transferred last night from the Bristol airport. Witnesses say the board took off immediately 
after loading the boxes. I'm sure they did. And it says that the gold transfer is speculated to have taken place because the Ukraine government had a legitimate fear and they wanted to put it into safekeeping at the Federal Reserve. Very safe. Very, very safe. It probably is safe as the Bank of England, who, as we know, have confiscated Venezuela's gold right now. They've had it trapped in there for a long, long time. Not the first time either. Okay, so there was 460, 70 tons of additional gold this year. There was four tons of additional gold in 2014. Both times, all of the gold, however much it was, we have no idea, but it all left the country twice. Interesting. Now it says here, here was another interesting story. This is just an aside, but I thought I'd drop this one into the mix too. Gold bars swapped for painted lead bricks at Ukrainian bank in Odessa. This is from 2014. The central bank in the southern port city of Odessa was allegedly conned into buying the fake bullion by a member of staff who used it to conceal the theft of the real bars. The state's Ministry of Internal Affairs has announced an investigation into the heist which could involve up to 11 kilograms of missing gold worth £270,000. And it says here that gold bars were swapped for painted lead bricks at the Ukrainian bank in Odessa. <laughs> so this gets more and more absurd the more you look into it. So apparently in 2014 there was an employee of the central bank in the southern part of Odessa, so a central bank of Ukraine, and he concealed the theft of real bars by conning the staff into buying painted lead bars. So I don't know if anyone out there has ever tried to sell, you know, a quarter of a million pounds worth of gold. But let me tell you, it's not so simple. People are not very trusting when you take that gold to them. If you want to sell that much gold, generally, pretty much 99.99% .99 of the time, like the survival rate of COVID, you have to have that gold tested. They want to verify the gold. And I've got a friend who uh, sells gold coins and he uses one of these machines. And these machines cost an awful lot of money. They set you back about $60,000. And they test the gold and they certify that it is real and that it's not a lead bar painted with some yellow paint. <laughs> so yeah, like I said, again, another very strange story. Can you imagine a central bank? Can you imagine a central bank getting fooled into buying 11 kilograms worth of fake gold and not testing that gold doesn't really sound accurate, does it? But that's what happened apparently. And here was another one that I found on Reuters. This is Ukrainian police seizing 42 kilograms of gold and 4.8 million in cash during the search of Ukraine's former energy minister, Eduard Stavitsky. So he was doing very well as the energy minister, 42 kilograms of gold, and 4.8 million in cash. Now, you'd probably think it's not gonna get any weirder. It can't be any more, can't get any weirder. Well, it does get weirder. This is a two kilogram gold bread loaf that was found in the abandoned house of the ex-Ukrainian president, Yanukovych. Remember, he got ousted. There was a coup, he got kicked out, he fled to Russia, but he forgot to take his two kilogram gold bread loaf and that was left in his house. And yeah, there it is, beautiful thing. And my final article on Ukraine and gold. Hunter Biden admits Ukraine firm saw his name as gold. Okay, I cheated a bit on this one. It's not really about gold as in the element. It's about Hunter Biden saying that his name is as good as gold. And it says here, Biden served on the board, earning more than 50,000 pounds a month from 2014 to 2019. Now remember, Hunter Biden has no background in energy. He knows nothing about energy, but I'm sure his technical advice helped spare the country on to success. 50,000 pounds a month, I'm sure he put that to some very good use. Okay, let's move on to energy. This is Saudi Arabia doubling its second quarter Russian fuel oil imports for power generation. Now this one's extremely interesting. Hear this. Saudi Arabia, the world's largest oil exporter, more than doubled the amount of Russian fuel oil it imported in the second quarter to feed power stations to meet summer cooling demand and free up the kingdom's own crude oil for export, data showed and traders said. So what's essentially happening is Saudi Arabia is buying cheap discounted oil from the Russians, it's using the cheap oil domestically and that is allowing it to sell its own oil back to the West for profit. 
Does that make sense? So this is just one of those weird things where we are still linked to Russia. Russia is selling the cheap oil to the Saudis, then we're buying the oil from the Saudis. So again, it's just one of those strange things that makes no sense. We're all meant to just nod our heads and not think critically. But at the end of the day, Europe is in an energy crisis. As I've said many times on this show, this winter, we are going to have to have energy rationing. And in the country that I'm in, they are going to be rationing that based on who needs it most. So I think the elderly will obviously be given priority. Thank God, because otherwise we will have massive excess deaths in the country. Now, I don't think that is potentially going to be happening here because I think, like I said, the government seemed to have a common sense strategy around it. And also, it's a very family orientated country. So I think that families would immediately come to the rescue and help their elderly relatives. Now, when it comes to countries elsewhere in Europe, that may not be the case. Now, I know that in the UK, for example, every winter, excess deaths in the elderly go up significantly. And when inflation is high, and prices of energy go up, these deaths also spike. And it says here, going back to this article, while many countries have banned or discouraged purchases from Russia, China, India, and several African and Middle Eastern nations have increased their imports. And this goes back to that BRICS um, and BRICS Plus, which we've spoke about. These are the countries that are supporting each other economically. If one country falls down, the other countries will step in to try and pick it up because we know that there is a greater agenda in play right now. This is the de-dollarization collective. They are all intent on getting rid of the US dollar as the global reserve currency and implanting their own system that will be more egalitarian. So they have to support each other along the way. And we're seeing that right now. So far, so good for the BRICS. They are managing to keep each other in business and Russia is managing to keep its profits rolling in. Moving on, EU to amend sanctions on Russia to allow food trade. Okay, and this is where it gets really crazy and wacky. You can just tell they have no clue what they're doing. You know, they're like Joe Biden going up the steps to the airplane. He keeps tripping up, tripping up. He doesn't know what he's doing, whether he's coming or going. He's asking the Israelis, where am I? What's going on? In fact, President Biden is the perfect representative of the US empire right now. It has no clue what it's doing. It's doing its best to fight back against the Russians, but everything that it does backfires and that is exactly what's happened here. You can see that it says under the changed regulations, they're gonna unfreeze the assets of some of Russia's top lenders, VTB, Sovacom Bank, Novicom Bank, Okritia, and some other one that I can't pronounce. But at the same time, they're going to add more sanctions to a different bank, which is the largest bank, Spare Bank, and it'll say that they will become the subject of more freezing of its assets, with the exception of resources needed for food trade. So it really doesn't make any sense, does it? On the one hand, they're saying, oh my God, the sanctions we put on Russia have backfired. Now we've got no fertilizer and food. Get rid of the sanctions on those banks because we're all going to starve. And then on the other hand, they're saying, no, but let's sanction this other bank instead. And this bank will sanction them, but we don't sanction anything to do with food. And it's almost like they don't think there's this two-way relationship. Like they can just say to these banks, we're doing X, Y, and Z. And that Russia will not do something in retaliation. That Russia can't just say, actually, no, we disagree. We're not sending the fertilizer. It's almost like they're living in this fantasy world where only they exist and only their needs are met. It's not how it works. Russia will clearly not accept having all of these sanctions put on its banks, except for the ones that are going to impact food. Russia's going to say, no, we're not going to export. Okay, so this one here is quite shocking. We've been following the growing unrest unfolding across the world. Of course, we've got Sri Lanka. So let's check out what's happening in Panama. Let's see how crazy it's getting over there. Hey, prendalo! Prenda, prendalo! So again, what we're seeing in Panama is this collapse type moment. It's high inflation. People cannot get fuel. They cannot afford it when it is there. The same with food. And people are getting very, very hungry and very, very angry. And of course, the protests are not mostly peaceful. They're mostly fiery. And I think, like I said, that's what we're going to see in the USA again. Once these crises kind of come from the periphery and get to the center, which is where it happens in Europe, the UK, the US, 
maybe Canada too, maybe Australia as well, or maybe those places just become more totalitarian in their kind of communist diktats. Because let's face it, some of these countries should have no crisis. You know, Australia can produce all the food it needs. Canada's full of resources. You know, Canada should not have any problems with energy. But we know that these central planners can create problems. You know, they can do that just through negligence. You know, like the US right now, for example, the US can be energy independent. The US has got lots of homegrown producers. It employs an awful lot of US citizens, you know, the oil and gas industry in the US. But Biden is seeking to import his energy. Why is that? Why is that? And he's talking about all these green policies. It's the same thing that we see here in Europe. Okay, on to the next one. So this is an interesting development. So last week, we talked about the president of Sri Lanka stepping down. And I said that although people are getting very excited about what's going on and thinking this is some kind of uprising and it's a peasant's revolt kind of situation, I did say that my suspicion is that there is something else behind it. There is another power behind it and that we will eventually see who that is. Well, cometh the hour, cometh the man. And you know the man I'm talking about is Mr. Herr Schwab himself. And Sri Lanka now has a new track and database system set up already. And it forces citizens to upload their ID into an app in order to purchase gasoline. So the QR code system has immediately come to Sri Lanka and here it is. <laughs> Interesting. Like I said, I haven't looked into that too much, but I've seen this video doing the rounds and I thought I'd share that with you because it's something that was already on my radar because a few months ago I found out that Iran, who are also having very high inflation, food problems over there, people are struggling to afford um, the basic essentials like bread, they have enrolled also a QR code digital ID tokenization system that gives people massive discounts on the price of bread. So essentially what happens in Iran right now is that if you want to buy bread, you can use this system. It's got a biometric ID. You have to put your details into there, have your fingerprints taken, retina scans, facial recognition, and then you can buy bread at seven times less cost than you would otherwise have to. Now you don't have to sign up to that system. You don't have to, but if you want cheap bread if you want to afford to feed your family and over 50 percent of people in that country are in poverty then you need to sign up to the system so again what we're seeing is all of these different countries across the world they all seemingly have different ideologies different belief systems some of them are allies to the west some of them are enemies to the west some of them are neutral to the west and yet in every single one of these countries we're seeing the same things coming round and round again biometric ideas digitalized tokenization of society, more authoritarianism. And of course, there are some very, very powerful people, and we all know who I'm talking about, who have been speaking about this agenda, speaking about all of those things for a very, very long time. And it's very surprising because you might think, well, have they really penetrated all of the countries in the cabinets, as Klaus Schwab often says that he has? Well, it seems to me, it seems to me like that may actually be the case. Okay, let's get to some finance. This is Ronnie Stoffelay, and this is emerging market dollar denominated bond spreads have widened significantly. So this is the dollar continuing its crazy rise and it's leading to all kinds of problems in the emerging markets. Now, some of these emerging markets, remember, are part of the BRICS. This is Brazil. Also, Brazil have a huge problem with dollar denominated debt, but there's also Chile, Colombia, Mexico, South Africa, another BRICS nation. Turkey, Pakistan, Egypt, and Kenya. So we need to watch out because these nations are all heavily exposed to dollar debt. And when the dollar rises like it is now, it can lead to massive, massive internal crises in these countries. In fact, there may be defaults. And if there are defaults, where does that lead to? Could we have a systemic crisis that infects the banking system, this contagion that spreads around the world? Remember, when we had the crisis Previously, when it was Iceland, nobody was looking at Iceland. Nobody really cared what was happening in Iceland's banking system. But then it spread throughout the unfortunately named pigs nations of Europe. And of course, we had the massive crisis moment. So this is how it works. It starts out on the periphery, but the 
global financial system is so interconnected. So of course, at some point, all of these chickens have to come home to roost. Something will happen. There will be some big domino that falls and it will lead to some kind of banking crisis, systemic collapse. And then what happens? Then you've got people having to be bailed in. You know, the banks that are gonna bail in, I talked about this in my previous video, bail-ins that are gonna come. You know, at some point, we're gonna to get to that moment that we're all dreading, which is where there is a reckoning for all of the debt in the system, all of the corruption that has led to this global chaos will have to, have to at some point be dealt with. You know, at some point we're gonna to have to deal with the fact that there are trillions, hundreds and hundreds of trillions in global debt. And when you're adding derivatives, we're talking quadrillions. Nobody even can conceptualize what a quadrillion is. It's impossible, but if you go online, you can conceptualize what a trillion is. And a trillion is a lot of money. I know it doesn't seem like it in this day and age where you've got central bankers throwing out trillions left, right, and center, but it is a lot of money. And if the next crisis occurs, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the ECB, they have no more bullets. Well, they do, they actually have one bullet. I always say this, they've got one more bullet, and that's the bullet that they use on themselves. And what do I mean by that? All they can do is print, but with inflation already high, because of a decade of low interest rates, and now we've got inflation back, what will happen if they print? It will send us to a hyperinflation. Of course, that'll be the end of it. That is the last bullet, and they're gonna use it on themselves and bring down the entire system. Now, of course, they will survive that, but people like us would be wiped out, and that is why we've got to share this information. We've got to look to the future, start thinking about self-sufficiency, but also about how we manage our finances. Now, we can't just panic, we can't just hide in a cave because some of these doomsday type scenarios may not happen just yet. So we need to think about investing also, and that's why we're gonna be looking at the market soon. So one of the things that I really wanted to share with you all is that I have a really awesome investment guru to share with you. She is one of the best investors today. She has made an awful lot of money with her fantastic stock picks. And I think if you follow her lead, you will probably earn an awful lot of money. Who am I talking about? Of course, it's Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi, and she got asked recently, has your husband ever made a stock purchase based on info he has received from you. Now, for those that don't know, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, a corrupt American politician, as corrupt as they come, she has a husband who is an investment banker. I think he's an investment banker or he is working for a money fund. And of course, he always seems to be on the right side of the trade. And Nancy Pelosi has earned an absolute fortune from getting these stock picks correct. So let's check this one out. This is quite a nice example of somebody getting called out and not liking it. Uh, over the course of your career, uh, has your husband ever made a stock purchase or sale based on information you received from you? What are you saying? Uh, over the course of your career, has your husband ever made a stock purchase or sale based on information you received from you? No, absolutely not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is Nancy Pelosi, one of the best traders in US history. She's always making the calls right. She managed to get in Tesla just before Biden announced an electric vehicle plan that sent the price skyrocketing. She managed to get in Microsoft right before a massive government contract, which did the same thing. And just recently, she got involved in NVIDIA. Her husband did a $5 million investment just before a new act came in called the CHIPS Act. And what did that do? It sent the price up 15% in just a few days and she pocketed a very handsome sum. So she's always on the right side of the trade. There is nothing at all corrupt about having politicians trading around positions related to government policy. There's nothing wrong with that at all. This is exactly the world that we all should be living in. So this is something that you see at the end of cycles. You see lots and lots of corruption of the political elite. Of course, the political class is always corrupt. They're always corrupt, but it gets worse and worse towards the end of the cycle because there's so many reinforcing parts of the system that allow the corruption. Nobody's trying to weed out the corruption, in fact they become more brazen in the corruption. And that's what we're seeing. It's much more brazen, it's much more out in the open, and there's not really any safeguards. There's nobody there to stop it, and that's because the system itself is so rotten. And like I said, this happens throughout history. Every time we get to one of these junctures where we're having this handover of power, the old system, the old system is so warped and rotten at that point that it becomes almost a self-fulfilling pr prophecy. There's no way they can escape it. The debt's too high, the corruption's too deep, and unfortunately, what they usually do at that point is seek to further 
assert themselves on their own population. So, that, so they actually become more totalitarian. They become more forceful when it comes to their allies too. And that's what we're seeing right now in Europe. We're seeing the US assert itself on Europe. You know, Germany had no intention of ceasing trade in terms of energy with Russia. In fact, when Donald Trump was in the office and he was trying at that point, before Ukraine, before any of that, he was telling Germany, I'm going to put sanctions on you if you keep dealing with Russia. So people forget that, that long before the Ukrainian war, the US was already pressuring Europe to cut its um, trade with Russia in terms of energy. And of course, I'm completely against Russia's invasion in Ukraine. I think it's a terrible thing and there is such a horrible human cost. But we also have to be realistic about these sanctions. We have to be realistic about ending this conflict as soon as possible so that it leads to less consequences like the ones I've just spoke of. And it seems to me like we don't have any real political leadership anymore. What we actually have is a lot of corrupt people enriching themselves whilst the real decisions are made from up ahead. So before we get to the market wrap, let's just check out this one. This is the Swiss Central Bank plans at least 50 basis point rate hike in September. That sounds like a lot, but remember, the Swiss Central Bank keeps rates below zero. So this is going to be the first time in a long time that the Swiss Central Bank has an interest rate above zero. So it's going to go from minus 25 basis points, uh, sorry, minus 0 0.25 basis points to 0 0.25 basis points. So, you know, the Swiss um currency the swiss franc is something that has always been seen as a safe haven and this goes back to the fact that the swiss currency was actually backed by gold right up until i think it was 1999 when they finally stopped backing it by gold and what they did was they sold a massive amount of gold and then started backing their currency with tech stocks and um, the nasdaq basically that's what they do and they've got trillions they've got trillions in foreign reserves They've got an awful lot of shares. You know, they're one of the biggest buyers. I think they're one of the biggest owners of Microsoft, of Amazon, of Facebook. They've got huge holdings and it's absolutely insane what is happening over there. So what they do at the Swiss National Bank is because the Swiss franc is such a sought after currency, it's a safe haven currency, it's always strengthening and it becomes essentially too strong as a currency. So they have to sell the currency which they do. So they sell Swiss franc. And then with the profits they earn from selling Swiss franc, they buy tech stocks and, um, you know, the big companies that I just mentioned, that's what they do. And that's essentially a money printing machine. So they create the money, they create the Swiss francs, sell the Swiss francs, and then use that to buy real things. Absolutely crazy. But this is central banking for you. This is corruption at its very heart. And what happens is, of course, now they've got massive, massive assets and people are still buying the Swiss franc and people still want to go into it. Um, even though it's not backed by gold now, it's backed by crap. But still, comparatively, the Swiss bank is doing okay. Now, here's another interesting thing about the Swiss central bank is you can actually buy shares in the Swiss central bank. So you, you can actually buy shares on the open market. They have a few million shares that are outstanding. So most of them are held privately. You don't know who owns them. Uh, the state owns them apparently, but Switzerland is a very murky country. If you look into the past of Swiss banking, they had some of the most secretive banking in the world. It was also where the Nazis did a lot of their transactions in gold. So they'd send gold to Switzerland to be refined. Uh, I think Switzerland, what they actually did during World War II, when the Nazis sent a lot of gold across there, they melted it down and then at the request of the Nazi party, they stamped it with dates before the war. So the Nazis could certify that this gold was actually not stolen. It wasn't theft. It was um, already part of our assets before the war. Of course, it was all revealed in history. But the Swiss had an awfully important role in allowing the Nazis to continue to fund their terror in Europe. And there's been many, many other instances of corruption throughout history too with the Swiss bank. So you can do your own research on that. If you want to buy shares in it, you can buy shares in the Swiss National Bank. You'd think with all those assets, it would be one of the best um, shares to own. But unfortunately, they cap their dividend at something ridiculous like 0 0.25. The PE ratio is something like one because of course, they've got so many assets. You know, it's insane. So it's a PE ratio of about one. So let's just check out the um, chart of the Swiss National Bank shares. You can see that they traded at 550 francs and then it had this massive increase. And you can see it's actually been something that speculators have bought in the past. Uh, there was this massive jump here. So it went from 
um, about a thousand Swiss francs and it shot up 600 uh, percent. Now I actually know the story behind that. It's quite an interesting one. So what happened was there was a wealthy investor and because the shares in the Swiss National Bank are actually very limited, he bought up massive amounts of shares, as many as he could get. And then he spread a rumor that the Swiss National Bank was going to buy back and um, purposely close down the trading in shares and buy back from all the investors their shares at a higher price. So he spread this rumor, he put it online, he did lots and lots of different forums online trying to get people um, excited about it. And of course, people started to jump in and buy the remaining shares. So the share price went up massively, he dumped all of his shares and the Swiss National Bank didn't buy those shares back, of course, it was just a lie, it was just a rumor that he created. But like I said, they're still trading, they still are doing this kind of step up thing. So if you wanted some strange speculation, look at the volume here. Look at the volume, 176 shares in a day, 370, 100. So very, very small pool of shares. Maybe in the future they will buy back their shares. Maybe they will. Uh, I think to buy a single uh, share is, well, let's let's check the exchange rate. $1,300, so it's not cheap to get into the Swiss National Bank and be a shareholder. Now, I always thought, what a great idea. I was gonna buy myself a share of the Swiss National Bank, and I was gonna head over to that bank, and I was gonna say, I'm a shareholder, and I wanna sit in on the board meeting, and I wanna have voting rights, but apparently it doesn't work like that. They don't let you go vote. You don't get to become a central banker and live out this fantasy where you sat there with a big cigar in your mouth, quaffing champagne with all of the other fat cats. It doesn't work like that. If you own the Swiss National Bank, you are purely speculating that at one, point in history, there's going to be this big step up or they're going to buy the shares back and maybe they will. Maybe in the future they will have an interest in closing down trading in the shares and they'll give you, you know, a premium of two, three hundred percent. Could happen. I wouldn't bank on it though. Okay everyone, just a quick look at the markets today because I'll do a full wrap up at the end of the week. But you can see we've got the Euro 50 here. Um, yeah, it's still bouncing along. It's not broken this lower resistance yet or support should I say, but once it does, that's when I think we start to see some really hard selling. Uh, same in the S&P, just kind of uh, meandering along, not really gone anywhere. Uh, we're down today 1.5%, the FTSE 100. Again, it's got that support down there, and I think until it breaks that, um, I won't get too excited by anything. But I think if we do break it, that's when we get the hard selling. Let's look at gold today. Gold's up a little bit. I mentioned recently that I thought this was the um, bottom for gold and um, 180 was what I said that was based on its historic um, support. This is a really good support for gold um, but I did say it will have to retest it and then we'll have to see where it goes from there. Uh, so right now we've uh, bounced off it a little bit. Is this the bottom? I think it's kind of irrelevant at this point given the pricing of the miners, particularly the juniors, but also the seniors also. There's so much value in the miners now. They're pretty much value stocks, but with massive, massive potential upside. Uh, of course, they're actually cyclicals. And if you look at some of the uh, junior miners, particularly, they are now at their cyclical lows. And this is the best time to buy those miners because usually what you have within six months of a cyclical low, what you'll find is that these miners have gone up three, four hundred percent, and that happens all the time. So if we go back throughout history, this, this is just one of the miners, and I'm not choosing this miner because I think it's a fantastic miner to own in terms of the company. I'm just pointing out its cyclicality. So you can see here that um, Fortuna Silver Mines is hit this level just a few times in history, and then it bounces up 350, 400%. Now remember, with a cyclical stock, you buy in at the cyclical low, and you sell at the cyclical high. And you need to try and understand where that is. You need to keep your eye on what's happening geopolitically, what's happening in terms of interest rates, what's happening in terms of central bank policy, because all of those things will help guide you when to get out. But essentially, the easiest way to do it is just to sell on the way up. You know, once you're up 100% in a um, equity, that's a good time to take 50% off the table. Because if you take 50% out, at that point, you're basically taking your original stake back. You can go deploy that in another company and then you can compound shares and you can keep getting more and more shares. Now, the money that you left in the company, that 50% is half the original shares that you uh, bought to begin with, but you've got them for free. So you can leave that to run up higher. You know, you can take profits as you go higher and higher. And if you miss the top or, you know, there's a crash in it, you're not going to worry. You can just hold on to them because they were for free. Now, the problem 
is if you buy at a cyclical high. So if you buy, say, at a cyclical high in this share and now you're down 75%, uh, that's very painful. You know, psychologically, it's very painful if you've got a portfolio that's down 60 70%. That's why you need to try your best to buy in towards the cyclical bottoms. Another problem with cyclical stocks is if you buy in at the cyclical low, ride it up to the cyclical high and then ride it straight back down to the cyclical low again. That can happen. If people treat cyclical stocks as a buy and hold, that can be one of the problems. But if you're in a sustained bull market in the metals, which is what I believe we are heading into in this coming decade, then buying and holding is a very good idea because you will see maybe 10, 15 or 20 X on those share prices over the course of maybe 10, 12 years. But that still doesn't mean you shouldn't try and get in at the cyclical low of a stock because that makes it extremely easy then to ride out the waves. You know, if you see your share price go up 70% and then pull back 40%, you're not gonna worry because you'll still be in the green because you bought in at the cyclical low. So just something to think about, you know, if you're buying a stock, is it a growth stock? Um, is it an established stock? Uh, is it a cyclical stock? Is it a turnaround stock? What is it? You know, why are you buying it? What's the thesis? What are you hoping for? And then base your buying and selling, your position sizing, and also your exit strategy on what kind of stock it is. You know, if you're in a growth stock, what do you need? Well, you need interest rates to be going down, not going up. When interest rates go up, growth stocks go down. So you just need to understand those relationships. And what else can I show you? Well, I'll probably leave it till uh, the end of the week. Let's have a quick look at Bitcoin. Um, yeah, you can see that this was the these were the two lines that I drew um, at the end of last week before we had these moves. So I said we're rather going to shoot out above here, retest, and then see some kind of um, price attack on the upside, or we're going to see the opposite. We're going to see it break down, retest, and then go down. Well, what's actually happened is we've done the first, which was uh, we broke out and now we're retesting and that's what's happening right now We can see it happening right here. We're retesting this line So what's gonna happen if we break back down through here? Then I think we see some hard selling if we fail the retest I think that'll open up the floodgates to lower levels if we manage to find support here Then I might be surprised because I don't expect Bitcoin to be making any um, Gains in the coming months, but like I said, you've got to watch the charts too you know, and see what's going on here. So we'll see what happens. I think if this fails, then we're probably gonna see ourselves going towards the bottom of this channel. But we'll check back in on the weekend. Thank you for watching today's video. Also, please go check out Palisades Gold Radio where I had an interview with Tom recently. Please give it a like if you enjoy it. Leave a comment. Tom does a fantastic job over there on that channel and I really recommend checking it out. And the interview, if you're interested, it's all about the changing global economic order, the consequences of that about World War Three and what that's gonna look like. And we also go deep on the metals and how they are gonna be used in this new system and what that is gonna look like for investors like you and me. So please go check that out if you're interested in the topic. Thanks for watching again and I will see you in the next one.